Greetings, Tom Earl here. Welcome to the celebration. I know you could be anywhere doing anything. So the fact that you are here with me right now in this moment together, it means the world to me. I hope you know that you are valued, you are loved, you are appreciated, you are amazing, just as you are. My friends, it is for me, January 10th, 2023, 4.04 p.m. I appreciate the heck out of you. One of the things that I have been sharing in conversations with people is whatever it is you're pursuing, let's say you want to be a number one recording artist in the world. You want to just have your song, millions of people listening to it. Let's say that's your goal. The day you get that, where you are a number one recording artist, you are you have added nothing to your worthiness. You are the same level of worthiness now as you will have or will be when that happens. There is no addition or subtraction to your worthiness because you are infinitely worthy. External accomplishments, external accolades, all these other things, they don't actually add anything to your worthiness because you're infinite. How can you add to infinity? Those things are exciting. It'll be exciting when you release that song and millions of people listen to it, but it's not going to make you more worthy. And if we just follow the through line of musicians, unfortunately, how many musicians do we know who reach the highest pinnacles of success only to feel massive waves of depression. Why? It's a complex, complex, complex question that can't be answered in one sentence, but I will posit that one of it is because you you realize, ah, accomplishments don't actually create lasting changes with internal feelings. I experienced that myself this last year, 2022, experiencing lots of success that I've always wanted to, I've always dreamed of, and realizing that what I've always been looking for was an internal journey, not an external journey. I'm going to share a little bit more on that here in a second. I want to go ahead and give a big shout out and thank you to my team, the brilliant, amazing editor and magician Chi Chi for the quick turnaround on this one. I'm recording this on the 10th and you are going to, if you, it's going to be released the 15th. So less than a week. I try to give Chi Chi a month ahead of time. I'll share a little bit with you why it's so last minute. And then Molly, I want to thank you as well for helping to get this out to folks too. Before we do that, if today is the, it's going to be coming out on the 15th, that means Wow, already the 16th is going to be Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And what I want to encourage you to do is I want you to read an article that I'm going to link that is called The Second Assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Subtitled King's Nightmare of Racism is Being Presented as His Dream by Ibram and the article is written by Ibram X. Kendi. You may be already familiar with this brilliant, brilliant scholar. Dr. Ibram X. Kendi is one of America's foremost historians and leading anti-racist scholars. He is a National Book Award winning and a number one New York's best-selling best author of six books for adults and five books for children, including the one that you might have heard of, How to Be an Anti-Racist. So this is a great article. I'm sure a lot of awesome articles are going to come out this year fresh. This one was published October 14th, 2021. want to recommend you read this. I am guessing that you have what this article talks about. I'm sure you've seen this where you see people who are explicitly, explicitly racist, white supremacists, someone like a Trump or some of these really, really far right candidates or basically anyone who in the past couple of years has joined the bandwagon of talking smack about critical race theory in order to drum up white support for their political power. And basically this article is excellent, excellent talking about how people like to, uh, especially white people, especially people who are 
uh, explicitly and implicitly racist, more or less like to use King as this like rallying cry of like color blindness and how we should all live in a meritocracy. So a couple lines in here that I'm, I'm going to read for me, but you should read the whole article. Um, so uh, Dr. Kendi writes, when King was killed, he was one of the most hated people in the United States. Nearly half of black Americans and three quarters of white Americans disproved of him when he stepped onto the motel balconies, uh, referring to when he was uh, assassinated. Death threats were a fact of his life. Article continues. I'm just reading some snippets here. I want you to read this yourself. Death threats to King's legacy are now sold as love songs to his legacy. King is adored in death. Literally, King is still hated in life. So he, he kind of goes on to, to quote some politicians, how they more or less quote King to back up their, you know, hatred for critical race theory, aka their hatred for people actually talking about race. Gives a lot of different points, and I'm going to read one here for you. But all of this disregarding of King's words has not been the worst of it. The distortions are what's truly lethal to his legacy, such as the claim that King's dream was for his four little children to live in a nation where despite numerous racial disparities, no one judges racism or mentions skin color and everyone judges only character because hierarchy of character is apparently causing the in inequities. King's nightmare of racism is being presented as King's dream once you read this article you're going to see tomorrow lots of people who are doing everything they can to uphold white supremacy quote king and make it sound like yay it's like their cosign okay but but we know that that is the farthest thing from the truth so this is a great article to read i'm guessing a lot of different articles are going to come out that are also going to be great as well so just wanted to mention that okay so at the beginning i talked about how much to Chi Chi and Molly's frustration and chagrin. Once again, I appreciate you all. Uh, I am giving this to the team with less than a week's notice. How did this happen? So I recorded as, as many episodes as I could ahead of time that would give the team ample opportunities to edit them. But what my goal was, was to take off um, almost six weeks from December until the beginning of January. Big reason is, at least in my industry, there's a, a big push to get as many sales as you can that last month of December. And one of my goals has always been, I want to take December to really just be with myself and be with my family. And then every year, inevitably, I get sucked into the whole hustle culture, if you will. Like, let's get these last sales, you know, work while others are asleep, like this whole thing. And then inevitably at the end of the year, I always say to myself, oh, next year. So my huge epiphany this year, I've, I've talked about another podcast, is that I, I no longer want to get this like big sense of self or identity or affirmation or any of this kind of stuff from, from my business. I have for so long been giving my, my business, whether it's uh, me as a musician, me as a poet, uh, me as a writer. Uh, or ultimately me as a the owner of an agency, that for the most part, that part of myself was getting the best and everything else was getting the rest. When I scaled my ads agency this past year and I was had you know the team and the clients and all these things that I always dreamed of, what I really found was there really wasn't a time where my business didn't follow me. So I'd, I'd create as much as I could structure where I was able to take my daughter to school and pick her up from school and we were able to spend time together and we were there on the weekends together and all this kind of stuff. But I wasn't actually there. I was there in body, but I wasn't there in mind. I was I was really just thinking, okay, I can't wait till everybody goes to bed so I can have some quiet time and get back to work. Or um, I'd be there on the weekend, but I'd really just be thinking of, of this fire, or this angry client that I was going to have to talk to on, on Monday. And I just really decided that I hated it. It just, it really wasn't worth it. That for me, my goal is to give myself and then those I love, my relationships, my best and everything else gets the rest. That's been my goal. So I took these past six months or six weeks. I didn't check my email or do any kind of work at all. And it was glorious. It was glorious. For one, I found that, well, first of all, we, we just had a house full of people for 
extended periods of time. And normally what would have happened is I would have just been very frustrated that I didn't have a space to do work and have meetings. Um, and instead what I was able to do was just like cook and be there for, you know, have make dinner for everybody and try to spend one-on-one -on -one time with each member of the family who was in town and run errands and just really go all in on trying to create magical experiences for the family. And then when everybody else, you know, let's say it was like a Wednesday afternoon and everybody else is at work or doing something, then I'd take that time for myself. I'd sleep. I'd uh, read a book. I'd, I'd go on a hike. And what I found is that I was just nourished when everybody would get home from work or, um, or the weekend would come and it'd be Christmas. And so I wasn't on edge. You know, I wasn't just burnt out because so much of what I found is that family time is predominantly going to be nights and weekends now if you're if you're single or if you're married but you don't have kids or um, if it's more or less just you or maybe one other person relying upon you usually this is at least for me the way life was structured was that I'd, I'd go 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 and then nights and like most of the weekends if I didn't if work didn't bleed in that's when I'd rest but especially when you have uh, kids or you start to want to invest in your friendships, even even if you don't have family, if you want to start to invest in any kind of relationships, for the most part, that relationship building is going to happen on nights and weekends. So in other words, like when you've kind of conditioned, when we've been conditioned of like work, 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 and then rest, either rest or relationships are going to have to be sacrificed. And, and both are just absolutely essential to life. So I've been trying to structure that rest, life, me, my own relationship with myself and my relationship with others. I really want that to get the priority. And when I do that, then I'm finding that what you really need to do is instead of working your face off, that you actually need to just not work and just rest so that you have the time for relationships. So that's what I've been doing. I obviously want to acknowledge the, the privilege that comes from having that choice. There's a lot of people who don't have that choice, who have to work three, four, five jobs just to put food on the table. I'm not in that situation. I do have that choice. And oftentimes what I see with my peers and I see people who get to the level I'm at, is they have the choice and they continue to make the choice of work, 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 burn out, burn out, burn out, burn out, burn out. And I'm trying to make this conscious choice of, of leaving that. So that, that's that been on my mind and I came across this. Well, anyways, that's the whole reason I'm putting out this episode late is I started work again, getting back into things Monday. Chi Chi, I saw your text. Can you get me this ASAP? <laughs> so here we are. That's why I apologize, everyone. But I, I thought that, you know, that might be interesting to you. Okay, so that's kind of been in the back of my mind, right? And then I see this article in the New York Times uh, that is titled, Noma rated the world's best restaurant is closing its doors. Now, I know nothing about fancy fine dining, um, what's it called, restaurant tourism. To me, my dream vacation, the new one that I want to do is go to Patagonia. And I want to go on that the, that hike. I watched it in Obama's uh, Our National Parks. So my dream is I just love to hike. Okay, I spent a week in Joshua Tree as part of my vacation. I'm, I'm not really interested in fancy restaurants unless a fancy restaurant is uh, a picnic in my backpack. And when we reach a, a summit, we lay it out and eat while just looking around and no one's around for miles and miles except for maybe one or two other hikers. That's That to me is like, oh my God, I, that's, I would spend, if I could hike, all the time, that would be my my dream. So I know nothing about this organization, this this restaurant. Okay, so I want to read some things to you about this article because it speaks to this movement or feeling or reckoning that I believe is is happening. Uh, clearly, not just to me, but to, to other places as well. Um, now we're going to talk about a restaurant that has uh, reached accolades that many people strive for and what the article references here is you know reaching these heights has a human cost so many people in my opinion erroneously have these um aspirations to be a billionaire or to be this tech titan or all these things without really recognizing the the human cost the environmental cost the the self-destruction that is 
inherent in being this like uh, genius, right? I'm a huge Apple fan. Steve Jobs created Apple. And we all can recognize there was a level of destruction in Steve Jobs' path. Not to put this all on Steve Jobs as the uh, symbol of this, but we can recognize there have been a lot of brilliant people, quote unquote, who have created these amazing technologies. And then when we kind of like peel back the layer, we can see the environmental, the political, the personal, the interpersonal pain that has been caused by these inventions, by this creation. And my whole just feeling is we we need to stop glorifying the end results and really hold the process, I think, to the highest standard. That to me, you can keep the technology you're working on if you're gonna take this same path of like, who cares who we hurt in the meantime, because the way it'll help humanity supersedes the pain that it has caused. I think that that way of thinking, that is what God has gotten us here. This is what's leading to the destruction of our environment, the destruction of each other, all these different things. How you do something matters more than what you create. That is to me what's important. So this article, I feel like is a little bit of a case study in that. So let me give you a little, little read here as I mispronounce every word. Noma has repeatedly topped lists of the world's best restaurants and its creator, Rene Redzepi, has been hailed as his era's most brilliant and influential chef. I'm reading directly from the article. Nevertheless, Mr. Redzepi told the New York Times the restaurant will close for regular service at the end of 2024. The article explains for those of us who have no idea what this means. The move is likely to send shockwaves through the culinary world. To put it in soccer terms, imagine the Manchester United decided to close Old Trafford Stadium to fans, though the team would continue to play. Okay, so imagine, I don't know, some insert your favorite baseball team, the Milwaukee Brewers, where they're like, you can't watch us anymore, but we're still going to play. The decision comes as Noma and many other elite restaurants are facing scrutiny of their treatment of the workers, many of them paid poorly or not at all, who produce and serve theirs, these exquisite dishes. The style of fine dining that Noma helped create and promote around the globe, wildly innovative, labor-intensive, and vastly expensive, may be undergoing a sustainability crisis. So basically what this article talks about is this style of dining that is just like super innovative, amazing like people travel all the world to come to they're basically having this reckoning that it is so labor intensive it is so expensive that it is almost impossible to do and make money so to keep the doors open without in some way having some form of exploitation okay and and anti-sustainability so they interview this other chef the chef's name is david kinch who last week closed his three michelin starred restaurant Menresa in Los Gatos, California. So he said, fine dining is at a crossroads and there have to be huge changes. The whole industry realizes that, but they do not know how it's going to come out. The Finnish chef, Kim Mikola, who worked at Noma for four years, said that fine dining like diamonds, ballet, and other elitist pursuits often has abuse built into it. He says, everything luxuriant is built on somebody's back. Somebody has to pay. This article, if you have the chance to read it, I think it's a huge kind of case study in this reckoning that I personally experienced in my own life. And that if I think it a lot of us is like this heroicism or striving after to imitate some of these um, success stories that we hear that seem when we look at it like, oh my gosh, that'd be so cool to do that. And we're almost like copying and pasting, trying to strive after achieving these accolades or success uh, or accolades or success that, that we're seeing. And, and what I'm trying to share with you from the folks I've gotten to interact with, stories I'm hearing that it's not working. Okay, these this the striving after success at all costs is, is having this reckoning. And and I've been hearing these conversations, I've been experiencing myself, I've been seeing it, and I read this article, and it's happening in this fine dining experience. I wanna encourage you to read this, and then I wanna th want you to think through in your own life, potentially, where this is playing out, where this desire to often um, fill a hole through 
uh, external rewards, external validations, external success, it, it doesn't fill the hole. It continues to create it. It buries it deeper. And while a lot of these systems seem really great, um, seems like it'd be really awesome to be the, the number one in this category. The, the lesson learned we can take from people who came before us is that it's not great, that it's highly stressful and the kind of stress that's, that's corrosive to personal relationships and to the body. So as you start this year, I'd like to invite you to just kind of reflect where maybe in our life is there a striving after that's potentially coming from a place of, of pain or potentially coming from a place of wanting to fill a hole or wanting to prove ourselves to somebody or wanting to prove somebody wrong or um, hoping that once I do this, then I'll be significant. Then people will know my name. Then I'll be this. Then I'll, and, and you know, those kind of things when you, when it's pursued with that, uh, that hurt or that trauma or that, that lack or that scarcity or that fear when we do that, that the place we end up at is really only a more indebted, a more uh, sunken into place of the emotions that started the journey. Starting the journey from a place of, I feel not loved. So if I can become the best, the number one, the undisputed champion in whatever your goal is, once I get there, then people will do the opposite of what they've been doing to me, or I'll feel the opposite of what I feel. Then finally, once I get there, then it'll be all good. That when we do that, instead of arriving at the pinnacle and you feel better, you actually have only magnified the negative feelings that you started with. Because to get there, so many quote unquote sacrifices, so many quote unquote uh, neglects, uh, so many um regrets, burn bridges, all these things that are rationalized as, well, it's all a part of it. Because once I get there, you'll all see. And then we get there and we see emotionally it wasn't worth it because we don't actually feel any happier. Whew. It's it's a, it's a mountain that you get to and you look down at the pain and destruction and stress and uh, loneliness and all those things that's if, if you if you just take the time to study some of these people who who've created these who become the titans of their industry that we look to and we see the depression and the uh, abuse to themselves and to others and we see the uh, either death by suicide or death by some sort of health condition that came out of living like that I just I just am really trying to do a good sales job here to share with you it's it's not worth it and to consider to take a different approach to building a life than if I can become the best, if I can become number one, if I can become the most significant, if my name can be sung the loudest, then I will finally feel blank. And that that feeling that then I'll finally feel blank will never come from accomplishment. It'll never come from achieving a goal. It'll never come from becoming the best of it can only come from within and so what does that mean well that's when you we start opening up the uh bell hooks all about love books that's when we start opening up the Brene brown atlas of the heart books that's when we start opening up the books that ask unanswerable questions what is infinity what is god who am i this right here, this, you are loved, you are worthy, you are amazing already. You have always been at your lowest low, at your highest high, you're the same level of amazing. When you fall on your face, you're fired, your business goes under, any of these things, you are the same level of worthiness as when you get the raise, you become the boss, you reach your first million dollar a year, you're the same amount of worthiness. So if there's any sort of underlying 
fear that your worthiness will be diminished if you fail or your worthiness will be increased if you succeed it's a myth it's not it can't and it's it's like so hard to wrap our minds intellectually around that and that's why it's a feeling start to practice the feeling of what does it feel like to feel infinitely worthy no matter what you do that this entire life you live you can never in all your decisions ever add or subtract from how wonderful and amazing you are at your core this doesn't absolve us from responsibility or accountability this doesn't absolve us from trying to spread love but what it says is while you're doing all of that stuff you are the same level of worthiness because you are infinite reflect upon that and then sit down listen to some nice music and just practice what that feels like and then from that place where you feel no lack you feel just pure wholeness then start to think well well what do i want my next steps to be what what is something that i want to build in this life from this understanding all right my friends I'm going to wrap up here. I want to encourage you to go to HBO Max and watch the live concert of Lizzo's that you can now stream. It's uh it's a gift. It's a gift. Watch that. So that is my invitation to you my friends. Check out that concert. I think it's a gift. And I have one question for you. If anyone knows the answer to this question, I've been trying to research it and I can't find a consistent answer. How do you pick up a snail? It's been raining out here. If you see a snail, I have heard that you're not supposed to just pick it right up because it can hurt it. I've heard things like you should put try to get it to go on your finger. I've been into some uh Reddit threads and there doesn't seem to be a consensus. So if you have an answer for me, how do you pick up a snail, y'all? I'd love to hear that. Let me know all social media is at Tom Earl Artist, Tom at TomRoll.com. And we would be honored if you would like to join our Direct Connect Experience community. Our mission is to boldly tell our stories and then to use the tools that we have to get them directly in front of the people who need to hear them most. If that interests if you, if you'd like to learn how to think like a marketer and combine that with the power of storytelling. We'd be honored to have you. You can learn more information about that. Tomrell.me slash DCM invite, or you're going to find the link below. We have a, this was a fun one. Glad to share this with you. Thanks again, Chi Chi and Molly for the quick edit on this. I appreciate y'all as always. I'm wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you. Oh, oh one, one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomrell.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching. Yay.